Okay, so this is another really good one. This is another interview that I've wanted to do for years and years and years. So anyone who's followed my work for a little while knows that I'm very interested in pseudonymously authored psychedelic chemistry books from the 1970s. I think I probably have the world's largest collection of clandestine synthesis literature. I have at least a digital copy of virtually every known psychedelic chemistry manual ever published, including many that people don't seem to even know about at all. And one thing that I've noticed in obsessing over these rare books is that there's almost always a good story behind them. Virtually all of them, when you trace their origins, something really interesting is going on. I'll give you some examples. There is a book called Certain Exotic Neurotransmitters as Smart Pills, or Compounds that Increase the Capacity for Mental Work in Humans by Hostine Nez. So this book was very weird for anyone that has read it. You can find free copies of it online. It's hosted by Arrowhead. The book is written with two layers of pseudonyms. So it is written by a pseudonymous person named Hostine Nez, but it is about a different pseudonymous person named Lazar. So Lazar is telling Hostine Nez about these strange phenethylamines that act as basically nootropics. And the book is really weird, and I always wanted to know who wrote this book. Well, many of you now know that the answer is Daryl Lemaire, Shulgin's longtime silent partner and collaborator. And that story, which was the Lazy Lizard School of Hedonism in season one of Pharmacopoeia, all started with my fascination with this small book written under a pseudonym. Another project that some of you may be familiar with that started similarly was Bufo Alvarius, The Psychedelic Toad of the Sonoran Desert by Al Most. I was fascinated by this book and how it seemed to have emerged out of nowhere and was associated with a strange religion and these t-shirts and who was Al Most? Well, now many of you know that the answer is Ken Nelson and that story was told in the Synthetic Toad Venom Machine episode that was the premiere of season three. So these stories are routinely amazing when you trace them to their origin. And there are many, many more. Those are just two. I've spent ridiculous amounts of time tracking down the authors of these various books, and I've identified quite a few of them. The Construction and Operation of Clandestine Drug Laboratories by Jack B. Nimble is another interesting example. This book bears the unfortunate distinction of being the most incriminating title for a book ever published. And it was actually used in a borderline comedic fashion by the government prosecutors during the trial of Ross Ulbricht. I was there in the courtroom, in person, as they talked about the files on his computer, and one of them was a PDF of the construction and operation of clandestine drug laboratories. Doesn't look good to a jury. It's, <laughs> I mean, I, of course, think people should be able to have whatever books they want, and just because you have a book about something doesn't mean that you are personally involved with the subject of that book, but to an average juror, having a book called The Construction and Operation of Clandestine Drug Laboratories might make it look like you're kind of into, uh, you know, the uh, construction and operation of clandestine drug laboratories. But I was able to track down Jack B. Nimble, a fascinating guy, and there's a really interesting backstory there that I would love to make a documentary about at some point. There is, of course, the infamous psychedelic guide to the preparation of the Eucharist by Robert E. Brown. I spent a ridiculous amount of time tracking down Robert E. Brown and figuring out what his real name is. And I was able to find him on his deathbed and do an interview with him shortly before he died, which I have recorded and I re-listened to recently. It's a very, very interesting interview 
but I am not planning to release it anytime in the immediate future because it converges with a different unrelated story that I'm in the middle of and I don't want to get into that aspect of it. But fascinating backstory on that as well. Additionally, there are the books of Adam Gottlieb, which was a pseudonym for John Mann. He died before I ever had the opportunity to interview him. There is Rich G, who is Richard Gutierrez, the discoverer and arguably inventor of the penis envy mushroom. There is Tariq Peterson, another man of mystery who wrote one of the most sophisticated clandestine chemistry manuals called The Alchemist, a very little known book. And he was a real person. I believe he was actually a mathematician. I don't know if he's alive. I've reached out to friends of his. I've never been able to track him down. I mentioned him briefly in this interview. There is O.T. Os and O.N. Eric, which for anyone that doesn't know, were the pseudonyms used by the McKenna brothers when they were teaching the world how to grow psilocybin-containing mushrooms. There is The Turn On Book by Robert G. Barber. I've never been able to find him either. I don't know if that's a pseudonym. I don't know if it's a real name. The point is that there was a time in the past when information was really hard to come by. Think of how bad people are on the internet. You have something approximating all of humanity's knowledge instantaneously accessible. And still you see people in YouTube comment sections saying like, does anyone know what the deal is with 2CB? Is that a drug or what is that stuff? Right? So people have difficulty finding information at a time when it is more easily accessible than ever before. Imagine what it was like in the past when it was actually difficult to find this sort of information. These sorts of books were immensely valuable. And one funny thing about them is that you would think that many of them must have been written by these masters, by these people who were the best of the best, right? You know, the obvious example would be P. Call and T. Call by Alexander Shulgin. These are kind of that form of book at its absolute highest implementation. And what I found, interestingly, was that quite a few of these people that wrote these books you know, they put some work into the books, but they had a somewhat passive involvement with the subject. As you'll find out in this interview, Michael Starks only synthesized two psychedelic drugs. This was not a big part of his life, and he moved on. Yet he wrote this immensely influential book on the subject. Uncle Fester has barely done any synthesis at all. He's done methamphetamine synthesis, and that's about it. He wrote an entire book on LSD chemistry, but never made LSD. And Ken Nelson, although he pioneered this toad venom milking and smoking, was not somebody that did it throughout his life. It was very important to him, but this wasn't something that he was doing in the way that some of these, you know, traveling toad venom shamans do now. He did it a few times. Okay, and, and one more thing, because I'm going to actually talk about Michael Starks, but before... I get into that, I want to just finish this preamble on pseudonymously authored psychedelic literature because this is something that I obsess over continuously. And there was this one insanely weird book called In Search of Altered States, Journal of the Gate Dancers. Not gatekeepers, gate dancers. I don't, I'm not sure I understand what a gate dancer is, I can imagine. It's not a term that I uh, have previously encountered. So this is the journal of the gate dancers, chemical research group, 1984 to 1986 by Jim Ballard. And there was one chemist who had, as far as I can tell, the only copy of this book. And he knew that I coveted this book, and I offered him everything. I offered to travel to him to digitize it. I offered him money. I offered him anything that I could possibly think of to ensure that the book wouldn't get lost. And he, for whatever reason, didn't want to let me see it in its entirety, and then he died. And then I started talking to his widow and asking his widow if she would allow me to document this book. But after he died, she couldn't find it. So I have a couple of pages of that book, but 
It may be that that book is lost to history unless I'm able to track down the author, Jim Ballard. And I may have figured out who he is, but uh, that's a, a story for another time. Okay, so let's get to the subject of this really weird interview. So this one should have been easy for me. Some of these other ones, just the story of how I figured it out is completely nuts. The obvious example being Ken Nelson and Al Most being the most convoluted piece of research that I have ever done and something that required not just me, but several other people working simultaneously to figure out. So why did it take me so long to identify Michael Valentine Smith? For those of you that aren't science fiction fans, the name Michael Valentine Smith might seem like a, a plausible real name for a person to have, but it is a variation of the name of the Martian protagonist in the Robert Heinlein science fiction classic, Stranger in a Strange Land, whose name is Valentine Michael Smith. This book was immensely influential in the 1960s. It's even considered ideologically responsible for some of the Manson family's beliefs. I was helping my dad with a Manson-related project and was trying to trace the ideological origin of some family belief systems, and so I wanted to read Stranger in a Strange Land, but man, is that book boring. That is one of the most boring, <laughs> that's one of the most boring books I have ever read. I couldn't get more than halfway through it, I, and the person that gave me the copy said, this is a really boring book, I've never been able to finish it, and I almost took it as a challenge. Um, and I thought, well, you can't finish it, but I, obviously, I can finish this SF classic. But uh, I couldn't. I couldn't get more than halfway through Stranger in a Strange Land. But reportedly, at some point, this book becomes interesting, and there's some kind of uh, religious association with Valentine Michael Smith, and this made him a sort of influential character to the psychedelic movement. That's my understanding. What I read had nothing of psychedelic value, so I don't really get it, but uh, it was a different time. I don't know. Or maybe I stopped right before it got interesting. I don't know. Uh, anyway, so this famous psychedelic chemistry manual with the name Psychedelic Chemistry is written by Michael Valentine Smith. So I knew it was a pseudonym, but who wrote it? I, at some point, heard that it was a guy named Michael Starks who'd written a couple of other related books. And I found some contact information. I tried a few times. Nothing worked. The messages didn't go through. And I kind of gave up. But I found him very interesting because Shulgin's protege, Paul Daly, had told me that there was an infamous typo in the first edition of this book, and I'm in Philadelphia at the moment, and I do have a first edition copy, but it's in New York, so I can't check this right now to verify. But Paul Daly told me that the first edition had a typo where they're talking about the workup of MDP2P, and he says to use hydrogen peroxide, which is H2O2, instead of water, which is H2O, and that this resulted in a sort of eruption that was really disastrous. So it's also funny to think how just the single misplacement of one numeral could have catastrophic consequences in the context of chemistry. So this is a book that was known about. It was pretty, and it's, it's mostly collections of published scientific literature that are all put in one place with a catchy title, which by today's standards might not seem like much, but back then that was a service that was hugely helpful for people. That was not lazy. It was anything but. This was an amazing resource. So when I finally got through to Michael Starks, He's now 78 years old. He was very friendly, very happy to talk to me. He had a lot of strange stories. He was friends with Shulgin, Alexander and Ann Shulgin. He synthesized LSD, PMA. He was driving on what he claims was just a couple of milligrams of PMA, but it must have been more. I think he's likely misremembering the dosage because it requires tens of milligrams of PMA to exert an effect. But he tells some really strange stories, then talks about his later career pioneering different technology for 3D movies and 3D visualization and studying the philosophy of Wittgenstein and really he's done a lot of weird stuff. Lastly, I'm uploading this file in two different forms. One is this audio file and the other is a video. Usually I don't think the videos are so interesting. This video is actually pretty funny. It might 
be worth watching the video in addition to listening to it. Um, yeah, that's, that's, I'll, I'll let you choose which you prefer. Their files are virtually identical. And in terms of the audio quality, a few people have reached out to me and they've said, well, why don't you just contact the people that you interview and offer to mail them a microphone before the interview? Or why don't you go to a recording studio? And let me just say for the record and assure you, I do. One of the things that I like about the work that I do is I'm very often interviewing people who have never been interviewed before, people who are not used to this in any way. And so I tried to mail them a microphone and I tried to go to a studio and this was the best I could do. I think it's all fully audible. It's not perfect studio audio, but I think you should be able to hear the strange stories that Michael Starks, AKA Michael Valentine Smith has to tell. I hope you enjoy. Hello. This podcast is available unedited and ad-free at patreon.com slash Hamilton Morris. Each month, I release three to four new podcasts, and it was Patreon exclusive until recently. Many people contacted me and said they wanted me to figure out a way to make it freely available, and so I decided to accept sponsorship from a few of my friends. One of them is David Rentlin, the founder of a company called Lucy Nicotine. They make nicotine gum, nicotine pouches, nicotine lozenges, some of which are made with synthetic nicotine, which I think is pretty cool. Now, if you don't already use nicotine, I recommend that you don't start. It's habit forming. But if you already do use nicotine products, and especially if you smoke tobacco cigarettes, I can say that this is a cleaner product. And it's also a product that I use personally. If you go to lucy.co and use the code Hamilton, you get 20% off your purchase. So, so, Professor, <laughs> how can I be of assistance to you? Well, you must know that your work has a cult following. It's very influential. No, I don't, I don't really know because, you know, I did that a long time ago and then I, I got into the... You know, writing the books about marijuana and so on. And then uh, in, in the 90s, I got into uh, th 3D television and movies where I have been, uh, well, to this day, uh, making uh, equipment and selling equipment and software and consulting. Uh, are, you ever, are you aware of that aspect of my life? I am aware of it only insofar as in my attempt to find your real name and to track you down, which I've been trying to do for years. Uh, really? I, yes, really. I can't believe it. It should be the easiest thing in the world. You would I, think. I'm, oh, I guess once you find out that I'm the person who wrote, you know, through the 90s and 2000s, uh, all the, did all the bit work in 3D movies and television, then it's a piece of cake. And once you or once you find out, you read the, um, the prefaces to the many books, uh, I've books, articles I've done since I switched to uh, behavioral sciences, you might say, in 19 uh, well, at the age of 65, you know, yeah, eight, 17 years ago or whatever that is. Um, uh, then it's it's a piece of cake. But if you'd never read that, and nobody ever told it, yeah, I guess it never occurred to me, and no one, your first one ever tell me that it's really hard to find me. But I'm glad, really, because, <laughs> you know, I really have no interest in talking to the most of the people. I'll make exception for some. But most of the people who want to talk to me, you know, I, I'm sure that I, I would have very little interest in talking to them. Because all, okay. I, all I knew was Michael Valentine Smith. So if right. you don't know that you have written books under a different name, it's very hard to make that connection. Oh, we, yeah, yeah. Yeah, right. If you, read, if you read the prefaces to any of the books, you know, like uh, 
suicidal utopian delusions of the 21st century, philosophy of human nature, and the collapse of civilization, which is I wrote 10 years ago. It's like a 400 page book with essays on all aspects of human behavior, uh, altruism, and many other things. In the front of that, and, and in most of my other books, was half a dozen others on similar subjects, uh, there I, I mentioned the the books that I have written, including the ones on psychedelics. Okay, anyway, here we are. Here and we so are. So you have your, you have my more or less undivided attention, at least as as undivided as it gets these days. Okay, <laughs> so. fantastic. Uh, well, thank you so much for making the time. So <laughs> I know that you've had a really fascinating life, and that you have been involved in many different areas, but. I am a chemist, I work with psychedelics, and I'm very interested in the work that you did with the chemistry of psychoactive drugs. So I know this was a long time ago. The book was published in 1973, I believe. And I'm just curious about how you got started in that, what sort of work you were doing, what motivated you to publish psychedelic chemistry. Just the, I mean, maybe tell me a little bit about your early life and how you yeah, got sure. to doing that. I can give you a, a whirlwind uh account of it. And then, you know, if you're really interested in, in, in something else, I can, uh, I'm happy to tell you. Uh, okay. I was a graduate student at Berkeley in physiology when I began uh, studying, writing, uh, taking, and uh, uh, synthesizing psychedelics. I did very little synthesis because I wasn't really a chemist and, and you can get and at that time, I was a graduate student. I could just order these things. And so I ordered mescaline and I ordered two, uh, di, let's see, dimethoxyphenylethylamine and a bunch of other things. And I only ever made, let me see, two things. I made acid because I got the, the, uh, basic materials. I got amine and the other couple of things you need from a guy who wanted to sell it. And I wasn't really much concerned with making money then or ever, but I, um, I was able to do that because he was able to get me those materials and I wanted to have a pure and unadulterated product. So I knew what I was taking. And so I did, I made some for him a couple times and uh, I took some of that to see what it was really like at various doses. And then um, I, I made, uh, uh, be, because I was, uh, I knew um, uh, uh, Dr. Shulgin, uh, have you ever met him? I certainly did, yeah, yeah. before he and died. You knew, and you knew Anne too. I did, you know, she died very recently. Yeah, 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 I knew them both reasonably well, but uh, since I moved away from the Bay Area and, and I I was busy and I didn't really, I stopped sort of having friends because I needed all of my my diminishing energy to devote to uh, uh, running my business, but above all, uh, studying philosophy and psychology, which became the consuming passion from age 65 until now. See, so, yeah, that is 16 years. Uh, so I made paramethoxyamphetamine because in uh, Dr. Shulgin's works, he, he made that among other things and found, I think it was he who found that it was a gram for gram, the strongest uh, psychedelic he could find. Just, you know, in, in microgram quantities, it was effective. So I thought, well, if I'm going to make one, I should make that one. And I did. And I tried it out a couple of times and found out that, yes, in low doses, like most of the other amphetamines of that kind, it was quite interesting. And I sat uh, after taking the first dose, I went out from my my Berkeley um, physiology department laboratory and sat under a a tulip tree that grew larger and larger and larger as I sat there watching the students 
walking back and forth. And eventually I came down and, and went back in. And then another time I tried to take a somewhat larger dose. And that was the last time I ever took it because I just discovered it's, it's highly toxic. And I had the o- only near accidental, uh, unfortunate circumstance that I had when taking a psychedelic ever in my life. Uh, I drove across Berkeley to see my girlfriend a few minutes after I had taken some. And all of a sudden, instead of well, one lane of cars on my left and my lane here, there was two lanes of of cars that were supposed to be on the left and one was on the right. <laughs> so I instantly closed one eye, solved that problem and made it over to my girlfriend's house and never had such a or any other problem like that again. And so that was the end of my interest in that. Yes, it was very strong gram for gram, but it was also extremely toxic. I'm going to pause momentarily for an ad. This podcast is also brought to you by the Apollo. The Apollo is a wearable vibrating bracelet or anklet that appears to be able to modulate your consciousness. And when I first heard about this thing, I was very skeptical. I was at a conference and met a psychiatrist and neuroscientist named David Rabin, and he had built this prototype and let me wear it for a night. During the entire night, I felt very calm and euphoric and good. And I thought, okay, well, maybe this is just placebo. But I also told him that if he ever built more of them, I'd really like to try it again. So he sent me one. And now I've used it for hundreds of hours. It's a very versatile, wearable device that they are selling for stress relief. But you can modulate the frequency of the vibrations to create either a stimulating or calming effect. You can actually sleep wearing it and it seems to help sleep or you can change the frequency and it has a sort of stimulating effect, which I sometimes use while I'm on a long drive. I've tried a lot of these different non-pharmacological means for alteration of consciousness, like binaural beats and various types of stroboscopic visual stimulation. Usually I'm skeptical of this sort of thing, but this tactile modulation of mood actually does seem to work. The idea being that it delivers a gentle, soothing vibration that conditions your nervous system to recover and rebalance after stress. That's the idea. It's sort of like a vibrating chair or strapping a purring kitten to your leg. If you find a purring kitten calming, then I think you would also find this calming. It's a similar sort of phenomenon. If you're interested in getting one of these devices, you can go to apolloneuro.com to read more about it and use the promo code HAMILTON for 10% off. Thank you, Apollo. Wow. Do you remember the doses that you were taking? Oh, no, I took, you know, it's my practice always, even taking aspirin, uh, to take the smallest dose of things that seems reasonable. When I, ta- I took what it was a very small dose, and it was like in the milligram dose because it had been gram for gram in the rat test. It had been... Um, you know, stronger than anything except LSD. And so I just took a, you know, maybe one, one or two milligrams at most. And, uh, and that was it. Can't recommend it. (laughs) Right. And so you were at Berkeley at a really interesting time. Carrie Mullis was there at the same time, right? I think so. But, you know, at that time, um, you know, it was, unfortunately, I never got into uh, genetics at all. I mean, it was just beginning to get interesting. And I was interested in a lot of other things. Uh, I did have some biochemistry, but I wasn't one of those who got into the genetics, like the genetics uh, very early. I went off into other things. You said you were studying physiology. What in particular were you interested in doing at that time? Well, you know, I was interested in a lot of things, but I was always interested in uh, insects, arthropods, uh, and uh, I started collecting butterflies and other insects in grade school. And so I studied invertebrate physiology in the physiology department. And that was it. I was interested in invertebrates and insects, beetles particularly. And so I um, I went there because it's you, you couldn't just decide to study 
uh, insect physiology. You, you had to study physiology. So I, I studied everything uh, and that was it. Right, right. And it's my impression that at that time in the early 1970s, at Berkeley, there was an enormous amount of interest in psychedelics. It wasn't just Kerry Mullis, there were others as well. Oh, oh yeah, yeah. No, I never, I, I never met him. And uh, uh, I did meet other people though. I met the Grateful Dead's acid chemist. Uh, let's see, what was his name? I haven't tried to think of that in years. Owsley Stanley? Uh, yes, that's right. So I met him and I met um, Jerry Garcia's girlfriend and the mother of some of his children. I met three or four other uh, people, acid chemist types, who, who managed to look me up through the underworld at that time. Uh, but I, I only met them once for purposes of really exchanging some stories and, uh, and that was it. Right. What about a chemist named Tariq Peterson? Does that name ring a bell? He was at Berkeley around then as well. Tariq Peterson. Tariq, T-A-R-I-K. Tariq Peterson. No. Yeah. No, I didn't. You know, of course, one doesn't exactly at that time or even now walk around with a sign advertising <laughs> or tell people, oh, yeah, bring over anybody you want who's interested and I'll be happy to talk to them. Uh, so I, I didn't make a real point of advertising. Right. So you're at Berkeley, you're interested in psychedelics, but you're also formally studying insects. And what made you get interested in this chemistry? I mean, what, what made you decide to start doing it? How'd you, you said that you used the university to order ergotamine and things like that, but I'm just curious about the steps, you know, how you found a chemistry lab. Were you doing this at the university or at home or how well, are you I doing didn't it? have to find a chemistry lab. But this, most of the things are simple enough. You can do them anywhere, you know, in your kitchen. And, uh, so I, I was, uh, as a physiologist, uh, graduate student, I had access to all kinds of uh, teaching assistant. I had access to the various labs and all kinds of glassware and so on. I did have to buy, uh, I did buy a Soxlet extractor through some friends because it wasn't readily available there. And uh, other than that, though, you know, I only did a couple of procedures, didn't need a lot of stuff. And uh, so that was it. Do you remember how you synthesized the LSD? Do you remember the process that you used? Wow. Uh, I, I used the most simple, straightforward one. You know, you get, you get the ergotamine and then let's see. You know, I, I never remember now. I hadn't thought of this in probably at least 30 years that there are several uh, different procedures. And I just can't remember what I used. It was very simple, though. You dump one in, you dump the other in. And you, you know, heat a few minutes and everything's done. And you tried the LSD that you synthesized? Oh, absolutely. A, a number of times. <laughs> well, that must have been really enjoyable. That must have been fun. Well, it was an interesting experience. And I'll say, well, I, I, I made this thing and look what it's doing to me. But it wasn't that interesting. It wasn't particularly more interesting to me than taking other things that other people had made. It was the results that were interesting. Right. Right. <laughs> and I understand the motivation to do this, of course. But then you took an additional step and you wrote this very important guide to psychedelic chemistry. So what motivated you to write that book? Yeah, well, I spent a ridiculous amount of time doing that, especially, as you know, in those days, uh, you you had to uh, go to the library to find it. The article was usually ripped out of the book. The book was usually stolen uh, or had critical pages ripped out of it. And so I had to go through interlibrary loan and so on and go to the UC uh, San Francisco Medical Center, which still had some books without the pages out. Uh, and then, of course, I had to 
uh, I spent a lot of time, you know, it's all with typewriter in those days, typing everything out uh, and uh, making the master and, and then getting it published. And that was your first book. Yeah, yeah, it was. It was 73. And uh, that was, uh, I was writing that while I was going to uh, grad school in physiology. Wow. And why did you choose the pseudonym Michael Valentine Smith? Oh, well, you know where that came from, no? I do, yeah. Robert, Robert Heinlein. So, and I, he was one of the biggest people in the field at that time. And I'd read a number of his works. And so I thought, oh, well, what I think of, well, I'll, I'll partly use my name and then I'll, I'll, I'll take, take off from Heinlein. Right. And do you like Stranger in a Strange Land? Is that something that... Wow, I have no idea what I would think of it nowadays. I'd probably think of it very differently. Uh, but it's been so long. I think of almost everything very differently <laughs> now than I did. In fact, I think of almost everything about human behavior and human civilization much differently now than I did even 10, 12 years ago. We got the rectal kratom guy right off camera right now. I mean, this is what you're telling me. I don't know that's <laughs> boofing kratom. It's become a meme on the internet. This is a kratom tea product. It's not intended for boofing, even if the pH of the human rectum is between seven and eight and the pKa of metragenine is 8.1. That's just not really relevant here. This is a tea consumption in hot water. That's what it's for. That's what it should be used for. If you want this tea, you can get it at toptreeherbs.com. Right. And how did you find a publisher for this book after you'd written it? Well, uh, Rip Off Press. You, you know who they are? I don't. Tell me. Okay. The Fabulous Furry Freak Brothers oh, and yeah. other underground comics. But, but what were famous underground comic book artists, Gilbert Shelton and others at that time, a, a group of guys from, from Austin, Texas, came to uh, San Francisco into the industrial district and started a uh, underground comics and book press. And I had met one or two of these guys somewhere. And so when I had it ready to go, I said, you want to do this? And it was crazy enough. And they were crazy enough. So they did. Wow. And did that book sell very well? Was it a big success when it was published? Well, I never made a lot of money from any of my books because I never tried. Basically, um, those sold a little. Although for me, I was living on a few hundred dollars a month through most of the 70s and into the 80s. And so uh, it was useful money to me, but I never tried. I, I, I could only I couldn't force myself to do stuff for money, basically. So I, I had to do things that I enjoyed doing, wanted to do, that I felt were a challenge. And uh, uh, I went from there to the marijuana book, which was much more lucrative, but not greatly. Uh, and I found a publisher easily because uh, Sebastian Orofali and his brother were in Berkeley then, and they began publishing marijuana and other countercultural books. And so he published, uh, well, let's see, first edition was what, a marijuana potency. And the second edition about a decade later was um, Marijuana, botany, and chemistry, I think. Right. So you were involved with this publishing on psychoactive drugs for many years. Well, you, you could say, I mean, I did those books and I did uh, editions, two editions of them. Uh, but that was it because uh, I became, I realized either it was going to be spend the rest of my life doing that or get into other things. And I was very interested in all kinds of other things. And so I gave that up and went into 
Well, the next big thing seriously was uh, 3D movies and television. Became an expert in that, which I am to this day. And I started several companies to do that and uh, developed a lot of products along with various engineers and, and made 3D glasses, uh, the world's first widely used home 3D television system, and so on and so forth. I want to talk about that. Uh, I'm really interested in all the subsequent developments, but I just wanted to ask a couple more questions about the psychedelic chemistry because it, you know, there's been the psychedelic renaissance. There's now hundreds of pharmaceutical startups oriented toward the synthesis of psychedelics and developing them as medicines. And I think that it's a really important time in history to document the pioneers and the work that they did. And books like yours taught hundreds, maybe thousands of people to make these substances. I think that they had a really important impact. And I mean, even there's one typo in psychedelic chemistry that is now infamous. I don't know if you know about this or not, but uh, I think you're describing the workup of MDP2P to make MDA or maybe MDMA. Uh -huh. I can't recall. And instead of H2O, you wrote H2O2. And so this became a <laughs> thing that uh, people would, you know, pour 100 milliliters of hydrogen peroxide onto the ketone <laughs> and, uh, and, you know, get a eruption of some kind. So, Nobody ever did that, did they? Yes. Yeah. The, uh, actually, a, a chemist named Paul Daly did that, who is Shulgin's protege, using your oh, book. Really? Yeah. Well, he should have known better than that. Anybody <laughs> who was the, a, at all serious chemist who really had taken just even a couple courses in organic chemistry would see immediately that that was a mistake. Well, I made huge efforts to prevent that from happening. I had to proofread every period in that entire book after typing it from often illegible manuscripts. You know, in the early days, you had to stand in, uh, before there were good, even good Xerox machines, you had to stand in the, well, I thought in the chemistry library, with an Olivetti machine that put out a continuous roll of wet sheet that you had to then tear off and put on the floor of the chemistry library and wait about 20 minutes until it dried. And then it was, uh, you know, sort of like a, uh, it wasn't really clear. It was like a gray background with a, a black, uh, a black letters on it. I mean, it was terrible. But anyway, I did stop, I suppose, thousands of people of the terrible frustration of going to the library to get the uh, article or the book, and it's not there. And there may be only a few libraries in the country that have it. Right. Right. Yeah. And so your involvement, though, is just limited to the PMA synthesis and the LSE synthesis, and then it became a sort of uh, publishing interest. Yes, that's it, because I didn't need to synthesize them. I, I could get things that I wanted. I was also a friend of Shulman's. And uh, though I never asked him, you know, because I, I was a, well, actually, we were working at a clinical laboratory, research laboratory. I was a med tech for a while, and he was the pharmaceutical chemist who did uh, analyses of various drugs for, for various people. He was in his, pri his private business, but he, he worked in that clinical lab doing work for them too. And so without saying anything, I would uh, sidle up to his um, cabinets there where he worked and look to see what was in there. <laughs> He was quite indiscreet about leaving things there. Of course, only somebody like me would really know what they were. But I got a hold of some quite interesting things. My first experience with STP that way and of uh, methyl, methylene dioxyphetamine and MMDA and so on came about in that way. And so I tried them out. Wow. OK, so do you remember what lab this was? Sure. It was, uh, oh, well, let's see. It was, it, I think it's not there anymore. It was a, a private doctor. What was the name? Sheldon. Oh, I don't remember. It was on 
uh, Telegraph Avenue in Berkeley, about eight blocks from the campus. And it was a, a clinical lab, did tests for doctors. And it had, uh, you know, he worked there, I worked there. Uh, I just can't remember the name, it was sold to uh, uh, a big uh, outfit that had lots of clinical labs. And sorry, I just can't remember the name anymore. Right. Well, yeah, let me know if it comes to you. That's interesting. I never heard that before. And so that that's, that Sasha Shulgin was working in a clinical lab and doing a synthesis of MBA well, was, type compounds. Mostly what he did, he, he, yeah, he did some synthesis. I think he mostly did his chemical synthesis in his home, his famous home laboratory um, on Shulgin Road in Lafayette. Right, of course. Uh, yeah, and... and uh, as far as I know, he never did them in the labs. I never really asked him. Uh, we didn't, uh, we talked together periodically. I was at his house and other people's houses together for the Berkeley Brain Center meetings, which we used to have, uh, where all kinds of uh, uh, bright and strange people from the university would get together and we'd talk about all kinds of, somebody would give a talk about something and and uh, I mean, he was one of those, he and I were two of those people who got together for that for a number of years. I'm going to pause momentarily for an ad. This podcast was also brought to you by Matcha.com, a source of organic, high quality, heavy metal tested matcha from Japan. This is a company founded by psychedelic pioneer and matcha aficionado, Andrew Weil. They have a variety of interesting matchas, including freeze-dried matcha cubes and a matcha sampler pack. All products are 20% off if you use the code HAMILTON. I especially recommend the freeze-dried matcha cubes. They are calling space matcha. It's very delicious. It dissolves instantly in water, and you can even dissolve it in your mouth and use it like a snack. It's a very futuristic product. I carry a bag of them around in my backpack. If you visit matcha.com and use the code HAMILTON, you get 20% off and a free gift. Thank you very much, matcha.com. So do you think he was bringing these samples from his home lab for analysis or what do you think he was doing at this lab? Oh, yeah, he was from his home. Well, I think mostly in, in the, those labs, he was being given these samples by doctors, by uh, clinical labs, by maybe uh, probably by the police, by the, the feds maybe. Uh, to analyze these things and, and tell them what they were and how pure they were. Right. As far as I know, for obvious reasons, I didn't. Uh, I was very careful about what I said to him and, uh, you know, the nature of our interaction. Right. And what did you think about MMDA and MDA and those sorts of compounds? Oh, well, it was spectacular improvement over amphetamine. I mean, it was a, a psychedelic that had very interesting, well, I described it to somebody once, uh, meth, and methyl MDA as being immersed in gray electric jello. <laughs> <laughs> gray, gray electric jello. Yeah, because well, wherever the world was all sort of throbbing and humming and uh, crystalline. Well, that was my personal reaction that time without adulterating with any other drugs or, or, or alcohol or anything. So I, I seldom combined drugs. Uh, I wanted the pure experience just a few times. The most interesting time probably was when I did some laughing gas. And you know how it makes uh, things, uh, music in particular, vibrate. Wah, 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 wah. Well, it did that to the visual world on acid with uh, laughing gas. It, as long as the laughing gas lasted several minutes, it made the visual world, not only as when you do, let's do just the gas, 
and listen to music where it, it vibrates and vibrates and vibrates and repeats the sound. It repeated somebody um, walking into the room and they would come walking into the room and walking into the room and walking into the room. It was, I was just stupefied the first time that happened. <laughs> wow. That's amazing. And given that you have the opportunity to spend time with Sasha Shulgin at a period when he was doing such foundational work on psychedelics, I mean, when I met him, he was mm. already uh, in his late seventies or early eighties. So I'd never mm. got to know him in his prime. So could you tell me a little bit about what he was like, what he was working on? He, he was pretty old when I met him. Let me see. It was probably in his late sixties by the time I met him, I would think I'd have to think about it, but he was already getting old. He was not spry. Um, but you know, he had that twinkle in his eye and he was just really energetic. And I'm sure he was a, a real terror to try to keep up with most of his life. Yeah. <laughs> and was there a community surrounding him? I mean, he had the famous yeah, research there was. group. Yeah, there was a, a lot of them. But, you know, because of who I was, uh, I, I tried to stay away from the group. As interesting as it would have been, all those very bright people he had around him and they'd get together and try out his latest thing. Uh, but, um, you know, I... I was involved, involved and interested in a lot more things, you know, like 3D movies and television and human behavior and how language works and so on. And so um, for my own and his and their safety, uh, because I'm sure I, I drew a lot of attention, but because I, I only synthesized a couple of times and never touched it again, synthesizing or selling, uh, I'm sure the feds were sniffing around me for many years, but I never gave him any reason to bother me. And did he know that you had written psychedelic chemistry? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. We, we discussed uh, uh, um, many different uh, items in there. He'd come over uh, to me at the lab where I was working as a med tech and he'd say, uh, what do you know about rat root? <laughs> and so we, we talk about rat root and so on. And what is and rat he'd root? Say, yeah, acerone. You know, you, you oh, could, okay. or, or, or maybe it's all called, it's called arrow root. But I think it's just rat root too. I, I can't remember. It's been just decades. And my memory is getting so bad now that uh, I don't know. I'm, I'm amazed I can remember all this stuff. <laughs> So we, we talked about a number of things, but pretty much, you know, what are you going to tell the master that he doesn't already know? <laughs> you know his wife were number one and two, probably in the whole history of the planet in terms of the number of different things they took and, and carefully uh, took notes on. Right. And did he approve of the publication of psychedelic chemistry i mean did he think this is a good thing get this information well, yeah, out there i think he did because it was very hard i mean even he to get to get those articles you know he'd go to a journal and they'd be torn out and then you know so it was a convenient all in one place uh, for him to go and he knew that the the, the information on this books articles uh, mimeographs and everything was just spreading like wildfire and would continue to do so. And so to try to keep it hidden was completely out of the question. Right. And did he talk to you much about STP or DOM and his thoughts on that? No, no, uh, we didn't. I didn't ask if I had asked him, I'm sure he would tell me, but you know, once you, well, first, once you look at these structures and you've taken a few of them, you can have a pretty good idea of what they're going to do. And uh, STP once was really enough. OK, it, it'll do this and that. And it lasts forever. Uh, <laughs> you know? And uh, DMT, once you do that, 
uh, okay, you have to smoke it and it hits you like a bomb. Fantastic visuals, and in a few minutes, it's over. It tastes and smells like burnt plastic. Uh, don't need to go into that too much more. <laughs> <laughs> My methoxy, demethoxy tryptamine. Uh, I said in my book, feels like you're being sat on by an elephant and absolutely no interesting psychoactive effects. What else could you say? <laughs> so you, you synthesized 5-methoxy DMT? No, no, I didn't. No, I got, uh, that's one of the ones that I bought. You know, in the old days, you could buy a fair number of, of different things. And uh, I don't know how many I bought, but, uh, you know, after a while, he, he was, you know, just light years beyond me in terms of synthesizing these various things and looking at them very carefully and having his friends try them out very carefully in various doses to see what they did. No one, I don't think, is ever going to be in his league again. Uh, and I wasn't certainly going to try. So I'd, after I had tried enough different things, so I, I knew, uh, you know, eight or 10 different classes of things. And I began to see how as published, they were in fact cross tolerant. And I was starting to develop, uh, if I took uh, mescaline, uh, then I was no good for uh, LSD for quite some time. And for who knows how many other things, they had similar receptors and there was a cross tolerance. Right, right. And did Shulgin ever talk with you about his experimental tryptamine compounds? For example, did he ever mention DIPT, diisopropyl tryptamine? Uh, I don't think we ever talked about that one. I would expect, yes, there might be some special effects, but mostly I think it would last, probably last a lot longer if you made the, uh, I don't know what I thought at that time, but if you made the tryptamine chains, the carbon chains longer, in uh you know marijuana AHC, you make the, the side chain longer and it, it lasts longer but is it more interesting well but if you put on side chains that the big side chains or you have methylene dioxy side chains well that's another another whole ball game right and did you ever make any synthetic cannabinoids or any derivatives of thc no no i I studied, of course, the master, um, Mechulam, Raphael Mechulam. And uh, I looked at his thing, but I, it was a, really a messy kind of compound to work with. And uh, no, I, I didn't see any need to synthesize any other things. I just didn't have the time and the energy. And uh, no, I didn't really have this not being a chemist, not having a, a really good lab. I, uh, and, and other people being there, uh, I didn't have a, a need to feel a need to explore the subtleties of adding a methyl group here and a side chain there. Right, 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 right. So you make this very important contribution to underground chemistry, but at that time, few people knew your name. I mean, were people contacting you, asking you for advice, asking you to uh, help very them? Few. Yeah, no, no, very, very, very few. Because as you, I never really, I always thought it would be easy for people to find me, and a number of people did, which made me think it was easy. Uh, but uh, I guess maybe it hasn't been easy, and you know, in a way, I'm sorry for that. In another way, I'm glad. <laughs> yeah. Do you still have any of the books left? Uh, sure, I, I have a few. I mean, they're still for sale. They're all, well, except for the first editions. Uh, there's still a few of those around from time to time on eBay and uh, Amazon. Uh, so, so I, I have a couple copies of one of the editions of Psychedelic Chemistry and Marijuana Potency and uh, um, those but just just and then of course the other two 
the movie book and uh, the, the history book, Carl Hartwich. You ever seen a copy of Hartwich? No. Oh, too bad. Well, you know, the, uh, 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 Michael Horowitz uh, and what's the other guy's name? Bob. Oh, God. They were uh, collectors, book collectors, bibliophiles who specialized in books on psychoactives, every kind of book from novels to, to, to alchemy. And they were in both San Francisco and they collected them and eventually got a, quite a large library of many rare things. I gave them all of my books. Um, I had collected a lot of uh, somewhat rare things as well as stuff I had to go through out to get like uh, a 1920s book written in German on cocaine. Um, and I had to get a photocopy of it sent to me from Europe and so on. Anyway, I gave him my whole collection, hundreds of books, a thousand articles or so that I had photocopied. And he sold the whole thing and gave me some of the money for it eventually to a, uh, I think a Swiss guy uh, who started a library and this had a good library and he bought all of their books. It used to be in the Fitzhugh Ludlow Memorial Library, downtown San Francisco, a little room down there. Right, right. I've never seen it. I've, of course, heard about it. It sounded amazing. Yeah, long gone. I mean, yeah. because he, it, was a, it was a wonderful library, but they couldn't keep it together. It was expensive, although uh, Michael Horowitz and his wife are the parents of... Winona Horowitz, who goes by the name Winona Ryder. Right, right, yes. Yes. So they now, of course, for many years have enough money to do anything they want, but he, he decided it was just too much I and mean, that somebody should have it. And he, he sold it to the Swiss guy who had a, well, already had a sizable library. And so, as far as I know, it's still in Switzerland. Right. I need to make a pilgrimage one day. <laughs> Well, you better, you better, uh, you know, you have a camera with you and uh, uh, a lot of time and, and make sure he, he he's willing to tolerate your poking around his collection. Uh, there's going to be a lot of stuff there. More, it would take you months to uh, digging through that, just, just photo, photocopying the things you want and so on. It's just, but Hartwich, you might still be able to get a hold of a copy of Hartwich. Even uh, even those two guys uh, didn't know about Hartwich, amazingly, because it was it's a giant old book in German. Uh, what did he call it? The oh, I can't even remember the names of these things anymore. Uh, oh my God. Yeah, I can't remember the name. Anyway, Carl Hartwich. And so I decided to translate. The photos were so wonderful. All these amazing photos he took all over the world during the 19th century. Uh, no one was ever going to republish that book in German, I was pretty sure. Although nowadays, of course, you could, you could do it easily. Uh, so I, uh, I photocopied the whole thing and I, I spent what was a a fortune for me at that time to have all the plates copied. And so I put the plates in the book and uh, published it. Fabulous illustrated history of psychoactive drugs and put uh, and translated all the uh, German text that oh, was wow. relevant. I've never even heard of this Hartwich. Yeah. Carl Hartwich, a classic, classic, uh, book it was the biggest most famous book on psychoactive plants and drugs for decades wow Published I, maybe 1890 or something i can't believe i haven't seen this i'll definitely track down a copy if it's possible uh you may be able to locate it somewhere of course nowadays i think you can get lots of places to just make Photocopies for you because they can do it automatically. You you may be able to find it on the world's greatest sources of uh, free books. 
the pirate sites, uh, which I assume you know about. Uh, I do. BOK.org yeah, B-O-K. and uh, uh, lightgen. What used to be IO, if not dot IS, I think, of course, as the publishers continue to squash them, they continue to set up mirror sites. <laughs> yes, yes. Okay, so you you made this huge contribution and then you decided you were interested in other things. So I'm curious about where your interest led you after this work with psychedelic chemistry. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm kind of surprised to think it's a huge contribution. I never even thought about it to this moment that it was a huge contribution because people, the people after almost immediately began publishing. Well, they published a direct ripoff copies of my book, which was fine with me. And um, they published, uh, you know, all kinds of others. There's dozens, maybe hundreds of them now. Uh, big, small, you know, varying qualities. And then, of course, you can get all this stuff online now. I think virtually everything's online. So, uh, but yeah, I guess it was a was a, an eye opener for a lot of people at that time. Yeah, it certainly was. I mean, there's you know a handful of these books. There's your book. There's the psychedelic guide to the preparation of the Eucharist. That yeah, was another. What is that? It was my friend. Yeah. Oh, you knew, you knew him. Yeah. The guy in Texas. Well, I, knew most, I, I knew almost all those people. I, I spoke to him on his, you know, he, I think he's de- dead now. I spoke to him on his deathbed years ago. Uh, I don't even remember his name, but you know, I, I was in contact one way or another with almost all of them. And uh, because, you know, once you write a book on it at that time, it was a very small group. And, uh, yeah, so I met, I met at least talked, communicated with most of them. And then I got strange letters in the mail from various people via my publisher because I wouldn't let them write to my address. So they wrote to the publisher and the publisher forwarded it. So I, I got a fair number of, of very, uh, interesting and some odd letters, uh, but I, I didn't, uh, I guess maybe I should have kept them, but I didn't keep them. Do you have any memories of, of that guy? I mean, I spoke with his daughter a bit, but, uh, he I was also, what, what was his name? I'm trying to remember. I have it written down, but he worked at an incense company in Texas and he was, I think yeah. a chemistry professor at one point. Yeah. No, I'm not sure I ever met him. I, I not thinking back on, I'm not sure. Uh, I didn't meet all uh, authors of all the books. Of course, I read all the books. Uh, and, uh, well, that was it. So, uh, yeah, anyway, to answer your question, well, I was always interested in a lot of stuff. Uh, so uh, after I got out of uh, the psychedelics, I, I realized that there was just no way, although I did keep materials for making a new edition for a while. I realized eventually there was just no possibility of going back into that. And then I got into the 3D and that that supported me. Uh, plus it was uh, uh, all encompassing, at least the way I did it. Traveled around the world, met all kinds of experts on 3D movies and 3D television and studied uh, you know, page by page all the page just dealing with the classes subclasses on uh, 3d uh, imaging devices and projecting devices and uh, that really took a huge amount of time for many years and then i wrote uh, the book 1996 you know um, 3d movies 3d 3d tv 3d movies uh 19 selected articles 1996 to 2017, I think. And uh, about that time, uh, I, I still did that because it was my uh, a way for me to make money. Never had a lot of money, never needed a lot of money um, because my main interest was, was studying and learning and being free and happy and healthy. And so what, what do you need money for? Uh, <laughs> and I had no family. I decided in my twenties I wasn't going to have a family. So 
So that wasn't a problem. And uh, I, uh, I stayed away pretty much from my, uh, my relatives because I, I could see they weren't going to be any help. <laughs> so I everyone stayed away from them. And I pursued uh, early in my life. I had met a, a philosopher in a philosophy class who understood uh, what I now realize was very little. He was extremely bright, but very little of uh, Wittgenstein. And so uh, I, years later, when uh, in particular, when I was living with my Chinese wife in China at the age of 65, uh, you know, 16 years ago, uh, I started full time studying. I had collected quite a few books on uh, philosophy, psychology, language, anthropology, and so on. Maybe a couple thousand, because that was the only way you could get them at that time, you know, pretty much. Even photocopying was a huge chore. And so I began studying all those things. And slowly, slowly, I began to get to the point after six or seven years that I realized or uh, my uh, <laughs> idea <laughs> was that I understood these topics better than the people whose books I was reading. And so I read a lot of it because I read a lot of other people, uh, many, many hundreds of, of philosophy books, books on language, books on evolutionary psychology, and so on, and tried to synthesize it all together or let it do its own synthesis. And so I began writing book articles and books and publishing them myself because I was getting older. I was well past my prime already, and there just wasn't time for me to fool around. Uh, and publishing requires a lot of fooling around. So I self-published all those books uh, from the late 60s up into the mid 70s that I was writing books and articles. I put them into books and I would uh, uh, publish them first on um, Amazon. They used to have this, maybe they still do this thing called Create Space. It was their way to publish books in paperback. Uh, anyone on any subject, you you just have to meet their criteria, uh, pretty loose criteria uh, for a book that was presentable, publishable, and uh, a scholarly book. And uh, and so I got them to publish it for me, so I could get some paperback copies uh, of my own. And then uh, right after I put the uh, PDF free uh, all over the Internet on what eventually became half a dozen different sites uh, where people could get everything free and the books, not only the articles, but all the books. And then I translated uh, all the books and articles, except for the, the early ones I wrote on, on drugs. I translated all the ones on philosophy and psychology and so on, about 2,500 pages worth of stuff um, into about 10 other languages using uh, Microsoft and Google Translate. And I knew four or five of those languages enough so that I could uh, actually uh, proofread it to some extent. And the others, uh, I would just have to... Uh, let it go, I uh, figured that, well, this isn't going to be good, but if the person is serious, they will use their own, they will make their own translation, and, uh, and this will attract them to a topic which they otherwise uh, would never see if they don't speak English. And that has been highly successful. I've, uh, academia.edu and Researchgate.net and uh, 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 philosophicalpapers.org, about maybe 150 to 250,000 people have downloaded from each of those. Uh, and then uh, from 
the uh, pirate sites and their mirrors. I have no idea, but I because they won't tell you. Uh, but it's uh, probably more. Uh, and then a few other sites. Uh, well, let's see. Uh, Social Sciences Research Network, I think it is, and uh, some other one. And so I've uh, spread my works out quite wildly, which uh, I wouldn't have bothered except that as I read them and went over them and over them and, and read and reread the books by a hundred different, very well thought of uh, philosophers and psychologists, uh, I became to feel that I, I really made a very serious contribution and it wasn't out there and I should really take the last of the energies I had as I was nearing 80 to publish it. And, uh, and so that's it. When I became about 74, I reached the point where I really just couldn't do it anymore as much as I want. Uh, but but it wasn't possible. So all I can do now is uh, I occasionally make a slight revision on one of them, uh, occasionally answer some questions, but mostly it's uh, YouTube. <laughs> <laughs> and for anyone that isn't familiar with the work that you did, I, I know that it's probably difficult to distill it to, uh, you know, some simplified form, but could you just maybe give me a little bit of an overview of what philosophical themes you were addressing or what ideas it was that these books were communicating? Uh, I keep, keep doing that. Thank you. Okay. Uh, let's see. Okay. Actually, if you read the introduction, just the introduction, to a few of them, which is very similar. Even the articles and books you'll find in some cases are very similar because I rewrote them and rearranged them uh, so that people could see it from a different point of view, which they otherwise wouldn't do. You'd think, for instance, I started out philosophy is one field, psychology is another field. And never the twain shall meet, or they may overlap some, but they're basically different things. And as I began to realize by and by, no, they are not different things. They are, although there are, no, no, Nietzsche is one thing and Wittgenstein is another. Um, and there are different topics, but by and large, uh, you either get grasp all of philosophy or you grasp none of philosophy. And psychology is the same. They overlap completely. If you understand one, you're going to understand pretty much everything about the other. And that's why one of the books that contains most of my articles, starting with the simplest, uh, the logical structure of philosophy, uh, I put uh, the small articles on just on language on the first and spread out to the last ones uh, where I, I dare to hold forth on, on uh, uh, the whole subject and on uh, much of history and uh, uh, politics as well. Not in a major way, just a very slow way, but my, my claim is that if you understand philosophy and psychology, you understand everything else about politics and history, and if you don't, then you don't and can't. So that's it. <laughs> Do you think that your work with psychedelics informed your philosophical work in any way? Mm, no. No, I don't think so. I mean, it was opened me up, you know, to new experiences and other ways of looking at things. And undoubtedly, that's that was very important and i'll never really know how important that was but so far as understanding how the mind works how language works the same thing pretty much uh i i don't think 
you know, understanding how drugs work and having those experiences is going to help you a lot on certain topics. It may, but uh, no, it's a different different study. It's a, just just a different study to understand uh, philosophy and psychology. And I I worked on it you know, until I was ready to fall down, <laughs> literally. At the end there, it was just, I just I worked until I couldn't really couldn't do it anymore. Uh, and uh, I think it was worth it. I think it's very valuable. I think it'll be easy for anybody to start out at the beginning and read on through. You start with the, the preface to, and the introduction tell you what I'm doing and why I'm doing it and how it makes sense and the logical structure of philosophy. That article lays out, it's, it builds on Wittgenstein and, 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 and the other great genius of modern philosophy, John Searle, and, uh, and imp improves, makes clear what they said and organizes it and uh, it should be possible now for anybody of reasonable intelligence and persistence to understand Wittgenstein and, and Searle and all of philosophy and all of psychology and all of history. Because it's all come down to the same thing in my not so humble view. <laughs> so you understand how the mind works and you understand uh, the basics of evolutionary psychology. Well, how does the mind work? Well, it's all there. I put, I, I made the nicest, what I, as far as I know, it's the nicest, clearest, most helpful table of intentionality that anybody ever made based, well, of course. Well, for uh, just for anyone that doesn't see the book, could you verbally describe the idea to me? What's take belief? A what's, what's belief? What's thinking? What's true and false? Uh, what is, uh, you know, I have to get the book here. Just a second. Yeah. All right. So the, the, the book. Um, well, uh, I don't know. I see what what can you see if I? Oh, yeah. Or should you? Well, I would like it to go out the back of the phone. How can I easily? Uh, I mean, it, it's. I was more thinking that you could just maybe verbally summarize uh, some of the ideas, but yeah. maybe it's better just to attach a PDF or something to the conversation so that anyone who's yeah. listening can. Yeah. Um. The be yeah. The best thing is you can just go on the internet. You can get these books, and you can get. Uh, you know, everything I have to say is in the summarized. I hope beautifully, or at least clearly, or more or less, in the preface. And then you might go to a book called Philosophy as Psychology, Psychology as Philosophy. Uh, it's a large book. It's got a lot of my articles in there, uh, maybe 400 pages or something. And uh, it... it the, the most valuable thing other than the preface it has is the quotes. It has quotes from mostly Wittgenstein and Searle, who I, I regard as the, the two best, the brightest and best. You know, Searle is still teaching or was teaching at my alma mater, Berkeley, until he was uh, driven out by the adolescent, lying, treasonous 
bastards who have taken over, in my view, um, our universities and basically destroyed free speech in the country. He wasn't leftist enough for him, for them. And so how could they get rid of a 70 year old, 80 year old teacher, a world famous teacher who's been teaching at Berkeley for over 50 years? You pretend that he's sexually molested you, you and one of your lying girlfriends, and you complain to the university. And so what are they going to do? They can't do nothing. And so they have to suspend him. And so he's no longer, as far as I know, teaching at Berkeley anymore uh, because the leftists have got him. So anyway, uh, half. Are you still hear me? Um, I can still hear you. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So that book, Philosophy of Psychology, Psychology as Philosophy, easily get it. Uh, you can buy it on Amazon if you're really into it or want a Kindle, but you can easily get it uh, PDF all over the internet. And um, it starts with well, maybe a 70 or 80 quotes, some of them uh, not terribly long, but long, a little bit long, which summarizes how our psychology works. How does it work? How, how does it possible that I can make <clears throat> squeaks or as Cyril likes to call them, acoustic blasts and you can make acoustic blasts back at me and we understand an amazing variety of extremely abstruse stuff about life and the universe. How does that happen? Well, before Wittgenstein, <clears throat> no one had any idea, really. And, uh, <clears throat> and then Searle took over. And <clears throat> between them, you could get an idea, but it wasn't clear. And so I have, I hope, combined them, uh, find them, tabularized them, and, and made it clear how okay. what you and I are doing right now works. Okay, I look forward to reading it. Thinking, thinking and speaking. It's, yeah, thinking and speaking. How does it work? How the hell does that work? And it does, has to have a logic to it, or it, it wouldn't work. Nothing in the universe works if it doesn't have logic. Otherwise, you never know what's going to do the next time. And so the mind and thinking and language, philosophy, psychology, behavior, anthropology, sociology, politics, it's all got to have a fairly simple logic. And it does. And I hope by writing those books, I have made it what was hell for me and everyone else is now relatively easy. <laughs> okay. All right. And then, and back to the 3D work that you were doing. So this started in the 1970s. Uh, yeah, the 3D thing started at the age of 11 when my father went, took me to see uh, a 3D movie that was uh, Buona Devil. That was the first one in the theaters. In 1952, Arch Obler, and I was just stupefied to see things come jumping out of the screen. And that started it, and the Viewmaster continued it. And many years later, when I was through with physiology and other stuff, and I was looking for something to do, I thought, 3D is one of the most interesting things. It dominates most higher animal psychology and vision, and it critical to the evolution and survival of the monkeys, the great apes in particular. And so why are we looking at everything flat? It's just crazy. And so I began working on it and I succeeded in starting some, several different companies, one of which supplies most of the technology to uh, 3D cinemas now. So you can see in 3D at a normal movie theater and uh, started 3D TV corporation. I made uh, many different 
pieces of hardware and software and really kickstarted the whole 3D industry. And at this point, I am still the last thing I still have time energy to do. I'm the sole supplier of the uh, what used to be the NVIDIA 3D uh, gaming and system and stereo geographic system. Uh, the NVIDIA 3D Gamers system, 3D Visions is called. Uh, what NVIDIA, is that? They, well, NVIDIA, NVIDIA was making a system for gamers to look at CRTs and later uh, LCD monitors and, and projectors uh, with glasses on, field sequential presentation of images, and, and you could do it in 3D by that means with one screen by alternating a right eye and a left eye point of view. When NVIDIA a few years ago became the biggest chip company in the world by making uh, chips that cost tens or even hundreds of thousands of dollars, uh, selling them to uh, the military and others, uh, they gave up on uh, supplying gamers with 3D vision systems. And so I, I now do it. And so I'm the only supplier at the moment, as far as I know, of stereoscopic uh, NVIDIA 3D vision systems, glasses and the emitter that syncs the glasses to the computer uh, to the US government and military. Wow. And <laughs> yeah, it's amazing. I mean, did you, did you do other work? Like, did you work with holography or anything like that? Other kinds of... Oh, no, I never did, did holography much. It's a whole nother ball game. Uh, and I wanted something to do to, to bring this experience of 3D to everybody at home with their game system, their TV set, their phone. And that's what I did. I, I played a small part in it, but a significant part for, well, since uh, 1973 been doing it continuously since 1973. Wow, that's amazing. Um, and were you involved in the film industry or anything like that in 3D very, film? Very little, no, very little. It's a whole other ball game. And uh, I was interested in the technology and in, and in being happy, healthy and um, free. And I don't think you're going to get too much of that in the film industry. Right. <laughs> Well, you know, these, <laughs> these sorts of 3D glasses are now uh, used somewhat routinely to visualize protein structures and things like that. Or yes, kind of yes. That's, that's right. And it was my company and two companies I started, uh, uh, Stereographics Corporation, which was the first one, which were the ones who were mainly supplying these, if you can believe it. And I had to work with the PC all these years because Apple, those retards, didn't really appreciate 3D. And so they didn't support stereoscopic 3D, never have. And so only PC-based systems exist and a few that were uh, cobbled together by people using Apple equipment, including me. I did the first system that did 3D, a serious system on the PC and on the Mac Plus, you remember that? That little little squ square, I think that's what it was called, square vertical vertical screen, black screen, tiny screen. That was that was the Macintosh at one time, 20 years ago. And I made a 3D system for that. Wow. Wow. That's really cool. Yeah, it's uh you know, from one outrageous thing to another. <laughs> but I'm afraid I'm on my last, my last outrageous thing here because I just, uh, uh, you know, I just don't have the mental and physical energy to push it anymore. I would if I could, but now I can only appreciate other people's stuff and, and look at YouTube and froth at the mouth over the utter stupidity and the evil of people. 
<laughs> explaining people. I explained people as as others do. Uh, anybody who understands uh, by uh, you know inclusive fitness, inclusive fitness that explains pretty much you could say everything about uh, life on Earth. Uh, organisms have genes. The genes are selected to make more copies of those genes or very similar genes, and that's it. There's, it's all called evolution by natural selection or inclusive fitness or uh, various other things, kin selection. And uh, <clears throat> that's the reason it all happens. That's the reason why we're doing this. If that goes away, any species that doesn't have that will disappear. That's why we're here. That's why humans ate their ancestors. And that's why very possibly again, very soon, they will do so again. <laughs> why do you think we have psychedelic experiences? Oh, well, you know, <clears throat> why we do art and music and so on, usually it's just a, a byproduct. And you can get it deeper into that and look at why is there, uh, you know, memory and why can we move and talk with sufficient speed? Why do we have good eyesight and hearing and memory? Uh, you know, it's all to help us survive and reproduce and, uh, and replicate our genes. But how, would a, more but how would a psychedelic experience benefit that? Oh, well, yeah, yeah that's just like how, how would that benefit music or art or many appreciating a sunset. Uh, we have to have uh, a, a very complex uh, cerebrum and uh, a visual system. We have to be able to reproduce colors and remember colors and shapes and uh, sequences of the same. And if you can do that, then you have to be capable of experiencing uh, psychedelics. And, the, uh, and we have those neurotransmitters over a hundred at the last count and still going strong of different neurotransmitters with their each with their own receptors in the brain uh, in order to make that whole thing work. And if you have that, then you've got all the basics for psychedelic experiences. Hmm. Right. Right. Well, I look forward to reading more of your work. Uh, I'm excited to learn that you've been so prolific under a different name. And I uh, really appreciate that you took the time to tell me about all of this. Well, I greatly appreciate your uh, calling me up and recording because this, is, this will be the only one. I mean, it's highly likely. I never, never recorded or, or you know, put this all down for anybody else. Uh, and I probably won't unless you want to do it or somebody else wants to do it again pretty soon. I'm in good shape now, but, you know, nobody knows about tomorrow. When you get to be 81, you can't count on anything except going downhill. <laughs> well, you look pretty good to me. And if you have any memories about that era when you were working with Sasha Shulgin or writing those books, or you find any documents from that period, please uh, write to me or call me anytime. You know, I'd love to hear about it. Well, you know, uh, you, you missed your chance there because the, far and away, the best one was Anne and she's gone, but you could get in touch. I'm sure with, have you ever met his son? I did. His son is dead as well. His, his, yeah. Uh, I, I, I never met his son. No idea about him. Uh, but and she has three or four different children. And yes. so they must have that stuff. And she, uh, and they would probably help you, I would guess. Yes. Yes. No, I, I know Anne's daughter and I know a lot of people related, but it's always nice to hear from 
different perspectives of people yeah. who knew him. So I think it's really interesting. Right. I well, I, uh, all I can tell you is what you already know. He was a very bright guy, uh, a wonderful person. And he stayed that way. As far as I know, his whole life. And the nicest thing, one of the nicest things happened to him and as his wife uh, died of cancer, as I recall, uh, in, in the middle of life at that. And she was a, a very frightened and totally unsuitable person for him. And so he found Anne, which was wonderful. Yeah. Yeah, that was wonderful. Yeah. It's a beautiful love story. Yeah. But anyway, thank you very much. Welcome to contact me. Uh, send me any info you want and I'll send you any info I, I have that you may want, but I, I don't think, you know, I've got copies of those old, those old books. I think both editions, if you really want one of those, but all of that stuff now is, is all over the internet. It's true. Yeah. It's immortal. Never goes out of print. Yeah. And I thought insofar as possible, I will be immortal, but that's only as, as long as the, uh, the books last. And of course, uh, uh, if AI comes along the way many people think it will, nothing about us will last for very long. We'll find out, or maybe. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's the sad thing. We probably won't find out. <laughs> <laughs> It'll only take with supercomputers, uh, you know, quantum computers, and so on. If it gets. Uh, if it gets to the point where that that fast, it'll go from a some people say, and I, I think they're right, it'll go from being this kind of world to uh, AI in the blink of an eye and never go back. Yeah, it will be <laughs> it'll, well, it'll be interesting to see. And yeah, yeah. It, it, yeah. Well, I wish you maybe a good, not. maybe not. Yeah, maybe not. And uh, yeah, but I wish you a good rest of your day. And I'll let you, I'll send you a copy of this when it's done. And, yeah. uh, and I, uh, I'll, I'll probably write you a couple follow up questions. But thanks again for your time. Thank you very much. And best of luck to you and your life and your career. <laughs>